programs and projects in line with other constitutional mandates, uh, which provides that more than uh, two thirds of the members of the elective bodies and, and um, public service uh, employees shall, shall be of the same gender. The constitution further makes environment protection an obligation of the government and the citizens, uh, specifically the contribution. The constitution encourages equitable sharing amongst both men and women of the benefits accruing from um, sustainable exploitation, utilization, management and conservation of uh, environment and natural resources. Uh, Kenya has also developed a number of policies to address plastic and chemical pollution. This includes Sustainable Waste Act. We also have the extended producer uh, responsibility, resp responsibility uh, regulations, and also we also have the toxic chemicals regulations, among others. These laws seek to address, among others, chemicals in products such as uh, plastics, promote producer responsibility in management of the waste, among others. Uh, in conclusion, Kenya thanks all partners, uh, W. ECF, SEJAD, all stakeholders who actively contributed and participated in these studies and the film development, which will inform Kenya's development and implementation of um, various laws to address uh, to address the one of the three planetary crises of the world today, that is pollution, which we shall be discussing uh, in this UNEA. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John Mumbo, and uh, sorry for ambushing you. Uh, I, was, I was very ambitious that I would know what the plans are, but uh, of course uh, I know that's on a different level. But thank you also for for, for your presentation and also for for for, um, for giving us uh, the plans that are there within the ministry. I don't know if you'll be staying for quite a, some time, but uh, uh, yeah, we'll be happy to have so you. I'll be able okay. to interject later. Great, great, yeah. and then we'll be have a chance to to to. to to put a, a few questions to you uh, in, in the session as, as, as we proceed. Uh, now we are going into proper uh, sharing of our practices and also uh, what people have been doing on the ground uh, in, 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 in real, uh, you know, in real time, and also the impact that uh, the pollution has, the impact that the pollution has had in many in, in many people who are working in this sector. But before that, uh, I think we will start with a, with a short video uh, that will be introduced by Sasha, and then uh, we'll dive uh, directly into people who are already working on the, in the sector itself. Thank you. Sasha, you're welcome. So thank you so much, Frederick. And um, I'm going to introduce a documentary film, which we have made together with CJAT and our partners from Tunisia for the UN. So we made a documentary film in 10 chapters. Film in 10 chapters. And please, if you are opening your microphone, mute yourself. Thank you, online. Um, and this movie has um, 10 chapters, and the first chapters look at the issue. What is the issue of plastic pollution and why do we need to end plastic pollution and how do we do that in a gender just and inclusive, socially just, transformative manner. And I'm just going to share with you the very first, uh, one of the very first chapters where we visited the Dandora dump site in Nairobi, well known, and where we interviewed some of the women waste workers. Because this is an introduction and then you'll see how important the solutions are, which we will be listening to in the panel. So let's see if my system works. So Dandora dump site uh, being a place where waste is dumped. In this country, there is no segregation of waste into organic. OK, let me hold on for one second and give you another version of that same film. Uh, yeah, no. OK, we'll come back to this later, Frederick. <laughs> OK, no problem. Uh, always uh, the technical hitch. I have noticed in every meeting that I go to, always the technical hitch. But luckily, we have people here who can help us in, in a given time. Uh, but we'll, we'll come later to, to you. And then you can help us to have the, uh, the film uh, shown. Uh, it's a very short film. I think that three minutes. So it should be, we should be able to see it later. But before that, I don't know if Dorothy, you are ready to give us the, um, a presentation in the report that Sija did on the, uh, Plastic Waste. Uh, please go ahead and do your presentation, Dorothy. 
Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the meeting. Uh, we are pleased to see you. My name is Dorothy Otieno. I work at Center for Environment, Justice and Development as a programs officer for programs on plastics and waste management. And today, as we talk about um, good practices in eliminating plastic pollution, I'd like to share with you what studies we've done. Um, but before I begin on the study and what we've been able to gather, here in the room, I just have a general question. And that is how many of us here believe... Dorothy, can you hold a bit? I think there's some... One person is, please, can you mute your mic if you're online, please? Uh, what's your name? Edna? Edwin? Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Apologies for that. So I wanted to ask the room, how many of us here believe that recycling is a way of managing plastic pollution? Believe in recycling. Let me see some of you. Killing our ocean and the, the life under it, but recycling will decrease the problem if, uh, of uh, of plastic. Already we have plastic everywhere, so we should uh, search for alternative. But the only way we we can stop uh, uh, increasing more uh, plastic now. But we can. But the what about the plastic in the ocean now? We can search for alternatives. Uh, but the plastic in the ocean, we can recycle it to decrease the uh, the problem of the plastic in the, our life because we we already have plastic in our bodies, in our ocean, in our everything in our life. Thanks. Thank you for that intervention. Uh, I saw a few hands as well. And so what I'm going to talk about here today is is our studies on recycling. Is recycling good or is recycling bad? Or is there a way in which recycling can be done? to prevent plastic pollution and also spread of chemicals in the environment. Our uh, study today will also touch on gender issues on how plastic pollution affects women. So I would just like to... Um, the computer, right? But as I continue, because I am sure I'll be able to give you a good picture of what I'm talking about, we conducted this study with the main aim of reducing and eliminating the production, the trade, and the use of toxic chemicals in plastics. And before we talk about circular economy and non-toxic circular economy, we needed to understand what exactly are these hazardous chemicals that are found in plastics. And so we went into a study and we did a pilot monitoring for hazardous chemicals in plastics. Of interest is that we went to open air markets where many people are able to access this market. So talking about lower and middle income communities uh, who go to shop in those places and where items are cheap. So that's where we sampled most of our plastics. We also did sample um, food chain. We wanted to understand food chain contamination. And I'll talk more about what exactly the exact food that we sampled. And later on, we also sampled clothes. And I'll go into details of what clothes we sampled and why. So to talk about the findings on the plastics that we tested, we so we tested black plastics and we found a lot of hazardous chemicals in the plastics that we tested. So we tested toys, we tested hair accessories, office equipment, uh, kitchen utensils, and they were black because we, we thought that black plastics are recycled from um, e-waste, that electronic waste are used to, some, uh, to be recycled into consumer products. So we were able to find high levels of um, brominated flame retardants, which are other uh, chemicals, in those plastics. And they're used to make those toys, those uh, consumer products that we use every single day. Some of these chemicals have actually been listed for elimination under a different multilateral environmental agreement, the Stockholm Convention. So to see these chemicals in our in the products that we use on a daily basis was deeply alarming. There is also a very interesting illustration of figures that I would have shared with you, but um, out of all of these items that we sampled, we were able to find that Unfortunately, the human, the, the women accessories are the ones that had high levels of, of chemicals in them. And the second category was the children's toys. So I'll just wait to, to see, to show you what, there you go. So the, uh, right. 
so this is the so this is a summary of the findings. Maybe you're not able to see the figures, but you'll be able to see where there are the red lines, the large red lines. Those are hair products, the hair accessories that we were able to sample for brominated flame retardants. And these are women items that we use every single day. And that is why we are saying when you talk about chemicals, it's important to bring about the concept of gender because then it begs the question, are women involved in decision making regarding these issues? And if they are involved, do they have enough information to be able to um, for them to make the best decisions regarding these items? And the small um, orange circles that you see there, they look yellow. Those are children toys. So our children are already exposed to hazardous chemicals and uh, Importantly, is that the, the the community that has access to these open air markets are many. So a lot of children are exposed to hazardous chemicals in consumer products. So when I go into the next findings on presence of chemicals in uh, food chain, I want to elaborate how this study was done. So we went to sample chicken eggs. And the reason we sample chicken eggs is because it's an affordable source of proteins for many of us here in Kenya. We, if you cannot afford uh, beef, then you can afford chicken eggs. And what we're able to find is, depending on where we sampled those plastics, uh, those chicken eggs, we could either find PCBs, which are also hazardous mm -hmm. chemicals that are found in um, in electronic waste and vehicles and uh, transformers. So where there are... Uh, please, again, I ask the participants online, remember to mute your mic because we can't, uh, we're having interference from this end. Thank you. Thank you. So where we had um, US dismantling sites, we were able to find the PCBs, a toxic chemical that's also listed for elimination. And along the dam site areas where there is prominence or prevalence of open burning, we were able to find dioxins and furans. So dioxins are among the most toxic chemicals and among, were among the first 12 chemicals to be listed by the Stockholm Convention. Um, so these are some of the items that we're able to find. So we assume that while we are eating, and the, the, the eggs are from the free range chicken, so the chicken that are able to walk around. So those um, there's some caution here that um, there is contamination of our food chain of affordable foods that we eat every single day. The thing I wanted to mention here about gender is where there are dioxins and furans, where the eggs are sampled around dam sites, a lot of women actually work here. So women, there are more women waste pickers who sit in the dam sites to do the actual sorting and collection, while majority of the men usually conduct transportation and are often out of the dam site. So women stay there. So women are the ones who are mostly exposed to these hazardous chemicals that were found in the in the dam sites. And finally, when I talk about the findings of the sampling from clothes, the monitoring from clothes, we're able to find PFAS in the jacket. So this is one of our colleagues. We had gone to one of the open air markets. We were sampling um jackets there and one of the jackets was actually found to have PFAS. So PFAS is called um is also called forever a forever chemical and the reason why it's called a forever chemical is because it cannot be broken down in nature. And so that is why when we get access to it, when we get exposed to it, it stays in our bodies, it bioaccumulates in our bodies, and then we transfer it to our children. And so it is alarming for women to have access to these, and of course men, but women, we transfer this to the children and the future generation is at risk of exposure. And so because of this, we, we had uh, quite a few recommendations, and one of it being that we we were calling for the whole thing of entry into plastic um, treated with brominated flame retardants for recycling. For example, the, the laptops that we have, we are not supposed to, or recyclers are not supposed to recycle that plastic into daily consumer products. So there is supposed to be strict standard to prevent that kind of recycling into normal daily consumable products. We needed to set, or there is need for parties to set stricter limits for persistent organic pollutants in waste, so that this waste is not ending up in the dump sites and exposing women and, and everyone else to those chemicals that we have identified to be there. And we also needed to call for restriction of brominated flame retardants as a class to prevent regrettable substitution. And that is to say that there are certain um, brominated flame retardants, for example, Okay, certain brominated flame retardants that have been eliminated and an alternative has been found for that, but it still falls within the same category. So sometimes ending up being more toxic than what has been eliminated. So that is why we're talking about uh, parties eliminating this uh, brominated flame retardants as a class rather than just one um, item. And that the plastic treaty should regulate and control plastic waste, especially the chemical content of plastic materials. So among the substantive elements in the plastics treaty uh, draft, we have an um, item on 
chemical contents and plastics. And so we're calling for parties to champion this elimination of chemicals because we have seen that it is found in the products that we use on a daily basis. And even more importantly, the use of non-combustion technologies, um, because we know, for example, that if we incinerate, studies have shown that um, that we, for example, developing countries do not have sanitary landfills to take the ash. And also that problem stops being a physical problem there and it is spread to the entire community when they inhale these chemicals. So it exacerbates the problem rather than reducing it. So with all this information and studies we've done, we had to create awareness somehow. So we have been able to conduct studies, um, uh, sorry, awareness uh, creation to the media groups here in Kenya who have written a lot about this to share this information with the public to spread caution. And, um, and also this has been shared at the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Conference of Parties just to make sure that parties understand the issues that we face. We call it on the ground and so they're able to make informed decision based on science. So for, for the other aspect of this, apart from that study, we also then use, um, with this information that we have, we have to share it. And the governments, for example, the government of Kenya has to make an informed decision. And I'm very happy that Dr. John Mumbo here mentioned that we work together. So Center for Environment, Justice and Development, so just together with the Ministry of Environment, we co-convene a Kenya Plastic um, Technical Working Group. And what we do in this working group is bring all the stakeholders in Kenya, civil society, industry, uh, government, all of us, to talk about what our priorities are. And, and from those conversations is where we develop the Kenya positions together. So when we are here, nobody is shocked or nobody is causing resistance on what we are discussing. And later on, um, one other recommendation, and because of those conversations that we have together, the Ministry of Environment, chemicals become a very important concern for us. And therefore, the Ministry of Environment is clearly championing the elimination of chemicals in plastics because we found it in our, in our, in our plastics in the country. And there's also this need for moving, um, for ensuring that there's transparency and traceability and tracking that whatever is produced and put in the market has to be uh, accompanied by information that everybody across all sectors is able to know what is what chemicals are in, are in that plastics and to inform whether a consumer, for example, myself, if I'm interested in it, knowing the chemicals in it. So sharing of information and um, to inform decision making. Um, the other thing that we talk about here is um, Kenya is in the process of also developing standards for products, for plastic products. So in these standards as well, we'll be able to, and as called for by the um, one of the objectives of the plastics treaty is that we have to at least have a minimum percentage of safe environmentally sound uh, plastic products that are recycled. So Kenya is in the process of developing these standards and, and we are just very happy that some of these study findings that we have are actually catalyzing action in the country. And this is also just to congratulate the Ministry of Environment for taking action based on that information. And therefore, as I conclude, sorry, I wanted to draw relevance for for why I was talking about this and how it relates to our meeting here. According to this, excuse me, the draft resolution on the circular economy here at UNEF 6 that is being discussed here, there's that, you may not be able to see, but I'll read it. But there is a lack of action at the global level on moving from linear to circular economies, which are hampering the achievement of sustainable consumption and production. So there's clearly a note here that there's really little progress in moving towards circular economy currently, and that there's also the need, there's importance in sharing relevant, transparent, and reliable product information along the entire um, supply and value chain. So this, of course, is coming as a, as a discussion here, and it's very important that, of course, our studies are able to somehow reflect in these conversations that are happening globally. So one of the, the call to action is that governments are supposed to enhance um, the design of toxic free products into a, taking into account the life uh, cycle assessments. So this is also one of the recommendations that we were mentioning that we need the design for toxic uh, for plastics to be toxic free if we're going to talk about um, recycling and also just to make sure that there are standards for minimum uh, chemicals contacts in plastic. So as I make my conclusion, therefore, is that plastics currently at this very moment, they do contain hazardous chemicals and their recycling accumulates those toxic chemicals into new products. And therefore, we are calling on countries to support the elimination of plastic and the chemicals in plastic and also just transition into non-chemical alternatives. So with that, I think I would like to end my presentation and we look forward to any of you. Questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Dorothy. I was unable to stop you when your time was up, uh, but because I was also enjoying the presentation. Um, it looks like no one is left behind. If you looked at the, uh, at, at our, listen to her presentation, women, children, food staff in our, on our table, everyone, it will be affected as far as uh, plastic pollution is concerned. But I also I want to open this session uh, for uh, for ten minutes question questions uh, to Dorothy uh, because the others who you see here they will be on the panel. You'll have chance to ask them questions. Uh, and uh, in this sense, I will ask the five the first five questions. Uh, uh, I would say three for who those who are in the with, with us here in the room and two for those who are online. And then Dorothy would be able to address that. Then we see whether you have enough time to, to ask for more questions. Can we have the first three from here, please? Okay, I'll go with the lady at the front, gentleman at the center, and the lady at the center there. Oh, your hand came last, so I'll consider you for the second round. So I didn't see your name. If you maybe mention your name and ask your question, only one question, please. Oh, I, I do have, have one. I have one. My name is Zaha Indimuli. Are we okay? No. I am the CEO and founder of Amali Organization. This is a group of around 2,500 women, young professionals across the country. What we focus is on green growth and circular economy practices together with inclusive youth development. And I'm very happy with the panel that we're having and how inclusive it is. And thank you for convening this. Now, I think considerably, I'll speak for the many young people that are not in this room and specifically in the regards of, this is information that is in documentation form and I appreciate the work that went to it. And I've seen the dissemination of the same information going to uh, the news, which is practically very okay. But considering that we're in an innovation systemic time whereby technology is advanced and this information is actually um, showing us that the people that are affected are on the grassroots, people that might not have the potential and ability to access all this information we have the potential to, to discuss here. How are we looking at disseminating this, this same same information to the public? And if so, since we are here on a solution-based particular discussion, considering the fact that we've been able to have a 1.2 million reach when it comes to disseminating educational purposeful information and environment and organization, I am more than willing to step in to assist with that. We can be able to have this information pass across everyone. But then on the account of the of the persons behind, especially this drafting, how do you involve the public who are actually affected by these plastics in a language that they actually understand? Of course, it's a technicality of what we are saying. Um, we put in that information on our products, but how many people genuinely read through products to see what exactly they are consuming? Probably absolutely no one, but of course there's somebody that does. But considering also the literacy conditions that we have and also having the gender systems whereby women also don't have the accessibility to all these resources, how can we get this information to the grassroots? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go at the center. Gentleman at the center, please, if you shoot your question, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. I'm Zabla Nogola by name, on the blog in Kenya. So for myself, I'm quite concerned on the recycling bit because uh, as per the latest data, we can only do it between 8 to 10 percent. Yeah, we can only recycle between 8 to 10 percent and uh, we are towards gearing towards, as we gear towards 2030, we still looking forward to manage to beat or to reach 40 percent recycling rate. As we, as, as we in this room, probably we cannot, the, the, we have a representative from the ministry can also share whether we have got a proper roadmap so that we'll be in a position to meet the 40%. And you can as well share with us whether recycling is the silver bullet towards curbing the issue of plastic waste. Thank you. Uh, we'll hold that question until when the, 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 Dr. John will be having uh, his time. Please note that. Uh, the lady at the center, please. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you, Dorothy, for the presentation. I'm just curious what informed the choice of three. Oh, my name is Christine Sayo. I'm from Let's Do It World and the World Cleanup Day Movement. I'm just curious what informed the choice of the three things you focused on. I think you said something about women's fashion products and what what. Uh, be I'm asking because uh, being in the environment space, there's also some conversation that's been started on cigarette butts as a form of microplastics and the effect they're having on the environment. And for me, I was also hoping 
not to place so much work on your plate or dictate what you do to see some of that in this. So I'm just curious why that was left out or what informed the choice of the three that you focused on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back and ask one more question to Dorothy because we're meant to ask her five questions. But first of all, we go to the online participants. I don't know if you can see any any hand. Yes, I can see one. But if you if you are if your hand is up, we have two questions for people online. Please go ahead. One person has a hand up, but I can't see whose name uh, the name there. But uh, uh, so in the chat we have a question about what are necessary social protection measures for job security uh, for recycling and waste workers. Thank you. No another question. Okay, uh, this is your chance now because your, your hand was up, right? Yes, yes. To Dorothy only now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Rémi Parmentier. I'm here on behalf of PR3 Resolve, uh, the organization based in the US, which uh, uh, works on uh, defining and promoting um, standard criteria and standards for reuse. And uh, uh, Dorothy, you asked a very good question when you started your uh, presentation, which was, is anybody, uh, does anybody like uh, recycling or not? I think that was your question, more or less. And uh, I just want to uh, emphasize that reuse and recycling are two different things. And uh, reuse is actually a, uh, 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 very important in order to uh, implement uh, correctly the uh, waste uh, management strategy, which places prevention and minimization at the top. How do you do that? Well, you avoid uh, manufacture and consumption of plastics, but for the plastic that is used, you prioritize reuse and not recycling. And that's what we're doing at PR, PR3. And I uh, want to take the opportunity of this uh, uh, meeting, thank you very much, to uh, inform you that uh, on Monday uh, at 8, uh, at uh, sorry, from 6.30 to uh, 7.45, we shall have an official side event in conference room one. Uh, uh, which we are organizing jointly with the delegation of Chile, uh, Fiji, and uh, the IUCN. Uh, it's called a Reuse, a Plastic and Climate Solution. And uh, you're all welcome. And by the way, at the end of the side event, uh, there'll be uh, a reception and you will continue the conversation over some uh, food and drinks. Thank you very much. See you on Monday. Uh, thank, thank you, thank 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 you very much. <laughs> uh, we welcome to a side event. Um, okay, uh, I will I will have Dorothy uh, to address those questions, and then we see whether you have enough enough time to ask another round. Dorothy, uh, but we'll see. Dorothy, can you quickly quickly uh, try to address? Uh, like Remy's was a comment, so you don't need to. Yeah. Get it. Okay, so the first question from Zahan is how are we disseminating the information to people on the ground? So yes, we do have um, a communications office. We we disseminate the information on Twitter, on Facebook. We write op-eds for everyone else to have access to. We are shortly planning to venture into TikTok. Uh, we have, uh, that's what I know that is what you wanted to hear. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. So we have also done some publications on YouTube where we have we have um, animated some of this conversation to make it less difficult to understand, and they're there on YouTube. Um, we work with communities that are impacted by these chemicals. For example, we work with the Waste Pickers Association, and you'll hear more about them uh, later. We also work with the communities at the coast who are also impacted by marine pollution. And we also also convene a different convening of civil societies where we train different civil societies in this space on all of this that we're learning. And the expectation is also that they can also spread that information to the communities they work with. So that is how we are disseminating our information. 
Um, I think Zablon, you your question was towards Dr. John Mumbo. Um, Christine, uh, you asked, why did we choose these three things that we focused on, the food chain, the plastics, and textile? So first of all, the plastics is because we understand um, plastic pollution is not just a physical issue. It's a chemical issue. Plastics is 99% fossil fuel and 1% chemical additives. And so because of that, we wanted to understand what additives are in those plastics. And because we know that plastics are, are not properly managed in the current waste management systems, we wanted to understand whatever they end up, is, it, is there any impacts to the food chain? Because we've heard of plastics are impacting on human health, microplastics. So we wanted to understand how do those plastics in those circumstances affect human health? And that is why we had to sample the food chain. On textile is also because we know that sometimes when we look at our cloth tags, we see that they are made from plastics, they're recycled plastics. And so we also wanted to understand, okay, these plastics recycled into clothes, what chemicals do they contain? So uh, technically is we already know that there are issues with plastics and we wanted to see how this impact on different environments. But we, the question that you asked, why, what is it that we did not consider and why? Uh, the cigarette buds, yes, there's a whole other different conversation on cigarette buds, so that's being addressed in a different forum, and that is, so that's why we did not focus on this conversation on cigarette buds, because it's being handled by a different. We have not done a study on cigarette buds ourselves, but I do understand that there are other organizations that are working on cigarette buds. Yes. Oh, it's an opportunity to do that, right? Eh? Do you, do you want to look at the last question and then we, yeah, the social just uh, jobs and yeah. Yes. So uh, the last, uh, the question on social media on uh, online was what are the social protection measures for recycling and for the waste workers? So Kenya together with South Africa, we are championing the just transition initiative in the International um, Negotiations Committee of the Plastics Treaty, because we understand that um, uh, the workers here in Kenya need support to move towards a cleaner, towards cleaner jobs in general. We also are supporting waste pickers organizing here in Kenya. And the reason for organizing or supporting that organizing is because we understand that they need alternative sources of income other than just working in dump sites. And therefore, um, they are moving slowly into other alternatives that are a bit cleaner and greener, for example, composting, moving away from dump sites. So these are some of the initiatives that we are supporting. So, um, uh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, that's the only time we have for Dorothy. I know uh, my neighbor here wants to ask a question, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we can't do that because we have five, five, five powerful uh, panelists here who are going to address uh, different aspects. And maybe you have a chance to ask your question. Then I'll give you the first priority because you are my neighbor. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, but also uh, my last question to Dorothy, where can we get this report? Um, where is it? So I would refer you to the IPEN International Pollutants Elimination Network website where you will find these publications uploaded over there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go into the next session and thank you, Dorothe. Uh, sorry, time is rushing very fast and uh, I feel also rushed, but uh, <laughs> we will manage. Uh, because we have five uh, panelists uh, with us, and I would like to introduce them uh, as, as as not in any in, in the order the way I, they appear from far end there. We have Natasha uh, Dorkovsky, pardon me if I don't pronounce your name properly, a director journalist, journalist for human rights, uh, North Macedonia. Uh, we also have Rebecca Muyuga uh, Musalia, uh, who, uh, who is from Nakuru West Pickers uh, Association. And we also have um, uh, Anita Shah, not sorry, yeah, Anita Shah, uh, who is uh, working on alternative uh, from Greenstem, uh, working on alternative to single use plastic. I think she has a very interest, interesting project that we all need to hear about and, and, and know alternatives that are out there. Um, we also have James uh, Wakibia, uh, who is a uh, long seasoned uh, <laughs> activist, uh, campaigner on issues around plastic and also a journalist, uh, photojournalist, uh, you know, and also working uh, with Rethink Plastic campaign. And he is, go he is going to share about that. Um, and last but not least, uh, we have um, uh, Dr. John Mumbo um, uh, from um, Ministry of Environment, but specifically from NEMA. And NEMA, we applaud them in Kenya because they were the one, they are the one who 
uh, ban the single use uh, uh, single use plastic uh, carrier bags uh, in Kenya, but we encourage them to do more. Uh, and that's why he, he is here today. And I'll shoot the first question um, uh, to, to you. <laughs> uh dr john uh, mumbo and uh, the question that i asked when you 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 came in uh, what are some of the priorities uh, to start with that you you you, are, you have in place uh to address uh, the plastic pollution in kenya okay thank you very much yeah. that's actually a, a very open question but i'll try to put it in the context of um what we are doing here um the priorities are quite an uh, uh, an a lot you've heard about the 15 billion um tree planting campaign yeah so that's uh, you may wonder why how does it come in of course um cut trees provide for sequestration when uh, we, we 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 incinerate our waste but that's just one of the big uh, campaigns that are being done by the ministry but going specifically to waste management uh, this is actually what i can describe it's always an evolving field and um the challenge that we've had as a ministry is to come up with a uh, standards standards that stakeholders can actually work on um i mentioned earlier we've developed um a chemicals policy and this chemical policy is actually uh, as it's actually provide a basis upon which we are able now to understand what is the uh, what are the priorities of the government how how is the government looking at we have looked at very many issues we are looking at um uh, issues of um circularity uh we are now getting from the um, you, you know you, you know the, the traditional way of um of, of waste management but you're now ex a, a encouraging the stakeholders to come and take part in um in managing the waste i think you've heard about extended producer um, responsibility we are working towards that direction so that you can have even um the ones who are producing this waste should be able not to, should be able to produce this product should be able to have a responsibility as to when it gets into 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 the uh, into the environment we are also looking at chemicals in uh, in in products is actually an emerging uh, area specifically we are looking at how it impacts on uh, Dorothy has actually given a very good uh, presentation here I remember when they made this presentation, it actually opened our eyes to know that this problem is not only on the West, it's actually also within the context of uh, within the region. And that actually is now actually informing us on now coming up with the best lens because we don't want to have a situation whereby we just pick um, standards that have been developed elsewhere and, uh, you know, uh, putting it on uh, co uh, this economy. It is a developing economy. We need to understand how uh, the, 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 the impact of these um, uh, measures that you're going to put into place so that uh, how it can affect um, uh, the, the, the economy, but of course, how we operate as, a, as an issue. So like um, we are looking at coming up with standards. Uh, we are talking very much about recycling here. The challenge that comes here is how, what is the best practice on how to do recycling? Um, uh, there's the segregation of waste, but more specifically, when you look at this kind of, uh, of, of, of plastics, how can I say that what has been recycled is safe for use? What has been discovered? Does it mean that type of done recycling? Can it be used for uh, human consumption, uh, storing food, uh, packaging, or after you know after 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 recycling? Can it be used? Uh, most most uh, players always prefer to recycle and um, use it, lose it like let's say in uh, playing fields or in, on road construction. But you see, uh, I look at it uh, much more. Uh, you know, uh, it will go and degrade, and of course start you know, to start releasing those um, chemicals that are within that product. So what is so keen and paramount to us is to look at um, this quality of the product, which is actually being uh, recycled. And uh, the other one is about, we banned plastics. And uh, of course, after burning plastics, it, I know it has caused a ripple effect, and you're really happy because it has encouraged some other countries within Africa, because you look at an, uh, the developing world, there are different dynamics that come into play. Uh, I don't want to mention the parties that have actually been there's one which has actually banned, uh, promoted the, 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 towards that approach. But the issue is this, we are now looking at, some are, are now encouraging uh, how I can, you know, we can, um, you know, we are trying to look at how uh, to encourage, like, when these products come in, we are investing in technology that will help us to be able to monitor or even to um to, to ascertain the, the 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 quality of the plastics which are coming into the country so that uh you we 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 don't we actually bring that as aspect of sustainability okay this it's quite an open question but i wanted to limit it into this uh um in, into this context and also 
the extended producer responsibility encourages the formation of what we call producer PROs, producer distribution organization. And this is, you know, you look at the chain on how different stakeholders can actually manage uh, this uh, this passing. I want to lift, limit my uh, question there and uh, to the, the answer. I hope it is satisf satisfactory, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes it is. Thank later. you very much. Uh, I think that was very comprehensive, uh, but we may follow up uh, later. But that it's very, very uh, thankful for for doing that. Uh, but when when Anita Shah uh, came uh, this afternoon, um, she she said we must ask you uh, <laughs> how we are going to introduce the alternative in in the market. And I'm gonna uh, now shoot the question to her, and uh, and also because I know she has a video that uh, she has to show. Uh, again, it's a short video. I don't know, but before maybe the video is prepared. But I want to I want to ask uh, Anita Shah. Uh, you know, uh, you are creating business yeah, uh, that produces alternative to single use uh, plastic. Yeah, can you tell us, uh, or uh, you know, and and how this is possible and the challenges that you have been facing, or whether you have already you know uh, got into it? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so. <clears throat> Green Stem Products Limited is a social enterprise that produces uh, alternatives to single-use plastic because the challenges associated with recycling are numerous. Um, and as we had heard, only about 10% of plastic is collected, sorted, recycled, and the vast majority of it is downcycled and eventually ends up in landfill and in the ocean. So the Green Stem was really set up to provide an alternative to this that is purely plant-based. We grow a lot of different agricultural crops in Kenya. There's a lot of waste that emanates from that. So <laughs> Green Stem's goal is to take all of that waste and to transform it into sustainable food packaging that is tree-free, so no deforestation, completely toxic chemical-free, no PFAS, no PE linings, no plastic at all, um, and to basically create an alternative to plastic food packaging that is functional, i.e. can withstand cold storage, uh, hot food temperatures, long travel times, et cetera, that is affordable, because this is also very important. Plastic is very cheap. And finally, that is um, uh, that is uh, sustainable, obviously, and um, good for both people and planet. So uh, our whole ethos is that food packaging should last as long as the shelf life of the food product in it and not the sh shelf life of the planet. So um, Voice of America visited us uh, a couple of days ago and they shot this little feature, which I think just captures in a nutshell uh, what we're doing. We're about to get some, uh, some bigger machinery coming in in the next month or two. And this will give us the opportunity to harness a wider variety of waste streams. Uh, we have our Kenya Bureau of Standards certification. Our products are completely food safe. We've entered the market. We have a patent on our product. And um, I think in terms of challenges, um, I'd say one, um, fundraising has been a, a, an enormous challenge um, because, you know, not all grants support private sector and commercial banks and impact investors are not keen to invest in early stage innovations. And this is an innovation. So this is the first of its kind in Africa, for sure. Uh, second, our whole manufacturing process is clean, green and circular. So we use byproduct of waste to generate heat energy combined with solar, we re recycle all our water and uh, we repulp all the edge trims, so there's no waste that leaves the factory. And designing such a system was was quite challenging. And um, given very high levels of taxation in Kenya, especially on machinery imports, we've um, really struggled to raise the funding um, necessary to import the machinery in. Um, and I'd say the final challenge is mentality. Today, I met a very big horticulture company, and they basically said to me, we're not going to change anything until we have to change something. So legislation and support from NEMA and the Ministry of Environment is key. I congratulate you on the ban on uh, plastic bags, but the em envelope needs to be pushed forward. And you now have a partner in Kenya that is doing this locally, creating green jobs for women, youth, and people with uh, disabilities. And we need your support. Thank you. Wonderful. Do we uh, watch the video now or later? Yeah. yeah.
please let's go ahead Yeah, what an inspirational story from uh, uh, Anita. And thank you very much for sharing this. Uh, I think we have something to learn from from that, and also to adopt um, in our you know in our different countries. Uh, but now I know we move to a different continent. Natasha, uh, <laughs> you have been working with the uh, socially disadvantaged uh, women uh, in Macedonia. Can you please share what you have been doing uh, at your end, at your end, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. As you see, I'm coming from uh, North Macedonia. It's uh, one small country in uh, Europe um, and um, thanks to the projects that we have implemented on the menstrual uh, uh, poverty we have um, uh, understand that the menstrual waste uh, is one of the big problem um, especially uh, it was one overlooked um, uh, of the women health and environmental sustainability then um, we um, we started to to explore what we can do and uh, how to do it uh, uh, how to do it uh, that uh, first of all we make um, uh, research on uh, uh, which amount of the menstrual waste we uh, we have it in uh, north macedonia then we have um, around um, uh, six 
100,000 women in um, a reproductive uh, period uh, age uh, that um, we have um, around uh, 200,000 um, people, uh, children and elderly that they use um, diapers. Uh, and we calculate that uh, monthly uh, we threw away around 6 million pieces of menstrual waste and diapers. No, 6 million of menstrual uh, pets, menstrual waste, uh, and about a million, million and a half of diapers. For one country, that it's only 2 million citizens. Can you imagine how it is for the other country? Then this was alarm. What we can do that this affect us? Uh, then um, uh, we go to a lot of uh, research, a lot of survey, and we saw that uh, the main uh, place where, we, where it's uh, uh, find the menstrual waste is the uh, beaches uh, and picnic area. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, beaches. <laughs> and then uh, we saw that now who is most affected? Can you imagine that the most affected was the school in our country? You can see the the second uh, the second. Um, uh, photos. Uh, this is not the photos to show how are the the toilets in our school. It's not everywhere the same, but especially in the rural area, and in uh, in uh, smaller uh, smaller cities, we have a lot of this kind, uh, which so which show that uh, uh, the, especially the girls um, uh, they don't have a possibility to throw in the, to uh, to make a selection of the menstrual waste. Uh, and uh, the um, research showed that um, I want to share with you, with you the data from the water utility companies say that uh, more than 65% uh, for the blockage in the server in the spillway fr are from um, discarded menstrual pads in the school toilets. Then what what it's happened because nobody uh, take care on waste, sel waste selection and menstrual waste uh, are treated as um, communal waste. Uh, we have a lot of uh, consequences that it's the increasing of infection for to the reproductive health, uh, of course, environmental pol pollution and social social in an inequality. Then we as organization, uh, we decide that we need uh, urgent action. Uh, please the next slide. Uh, um, we are talking what 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 will be the solutions that we saw that the solution it will be in the um, uh, alternative products. Uh, what it means that in our country you can find only traditional menstrual pads uh, uh, that they are full with the plastics. Uh, we know everything. Every, all of us we know about this. That uh, the solution was to to us uh, to import the organic uh, uh, parts or to start uh, to produce uh, reusable parts uh, that uh, uh, that everyone can use it. Um, you know, the organic um, pets were very expensive. At the moment, we have uh, a big percent of menstrual poverty that if we say yes, we can import um, the organic uh, menstrual parts, nobody can buy it, then we will have biggest problem. Then we decided to set up one social entrepreneurship uh, and start uh, to sweep the menstrual parts. Uh, because it's a social uh, entrepreneurship, uh, we invite uh, all the women in social risk, uh, the women that they lost their job, uh, the women that they, they are not uh, uh, qualified to find some job, or the women uh, who are in the process of their dictation, the women who are addicted and now they are in the process of rehabilitation, to come and uh, to join our uh, company to work on sewing the menstrual pads, uh, reusable menstrual pads. Of course, uh, we find um, uh, 20 women that at the moment uh, work on the sewing and um, um, sell it uh, this, uh, these pads. I can say that um, uh, with, uh, with this action, uh, we say urgent action for us. Um, um, uh, we have um, uh, now uh, less uh, uh, less pollution. Of course, it, this is not uh, big production, but we try to solve uh, uh, to, to piloting and to solve that we have uh, in that place less pollution. We have a decreasing of the infection and of course uh, uh, reduction the menstrual poverty. But our aim is at the moment uh, uh, to. Um, uh, to negotiate with our country, uh, each girl who is involved in the regular curricula to receive the one package with five reusable parts uh, and using uh, during the three till five uh, five years. I think that in that indeed in that way we will uh, have uh, some solutions.
Uh, also, I want to say that this is not uh, that this is not happen only in uh, in our country. That this is really a uh, topic uh, about uh, they are talking uh, everywhere. We have uh, some. Uh, uh, some um, uh, example from uh, Africa that also they have producing the affordable plastic free sanitary product uh, and uh, in India that they work uh, in the producing affordable and environmental sustainable menstrual solutions. Um, then this is the organization Bond uh, from India. Uh, they also have uh, awareness campaign. Uh, they also work on the menstrual cups, uh, uh, pants uh, that uh, they have uh, in their work a lot of alternative menstrual products that will help in uh, managing the menstrual health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natasha. And so uh, we we'll, uh, just to try and break uh, because the first three, uh, or the first two, three and two present presentations are giving us solutions. Uh, I think it's always fair to have uh, the first round of questions so that we address that part of the solution. And before we come to the people who are working with wastes, uh, which is a uh, um, 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 Okivia and also Rebecca. Uh, but if you have the very first five questions, again, um, uh, the first hand up uh, will. Okay, my neighbor, I promise my neighbor, oh, but the hand is not up. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, the, the lady, yeah, there. And then uh, this gentleman and uh, the lady at the corner there. Uh, we we'll start with you. Yes, please. Your name and your question to uh, to whom is it, it is addressed. Um, then, uh, yeah. Great. Thank you. My name is Priscilla Ramo. I'm a, uh, I believe uh, I'm an environmentalist, whereby I believe in uh, taking care of our environment. And I have a question directed to Mr. Uh, the guy from the ministry. <laughs> Dr. John Mumbo. Yeah. My apologies. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, the name uh, policy about banning the plastic uh, bag, which was probably in 2017, 2018. Um, to my own understanding and to my own view of things, uh, when the government decided to ban the plastic bag, the single plastic bag, uh, what was it, its motive? Was it to create uh, a sustainable future or was it to create more problems because uh, currently in the market, uh, the plastic bags which replaced the single use bags, I believe they're still plastic. They are not sustainable. So what was your motive behind banning these plastics and still create more problems for the society? Thank you. Gentlemen at the center here. Thank you so much. Um, all. Uh, Protocols observed. I'm Larry Duane. I'm an artist, award-winning artist. I use music to create awareness about the environment, and uh, I have my, a background on waste management. So, I think I just have a comment first uh, regarding the plastic recycling. I think it's just a blanket solution to motivate manufacturers to manufacture more, and uh, it's not an option anymore. So, I feel like if we can transition into green economy by supporting people like Miss Anita Shah with their sustainable products. I think that's a better way to approach this. And my question is, what steps are the government taking into making transitioning into sustainable options affordable for the people of Kenya? Thank you. Your question is to Dr. Mumba, right? Thank you. Minister of Environment. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Magzin, at least I know not your name. Magzin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maxine Waite. I'm representing the Environmental Coalition on Standards, um, and it's an environmental NGO. So my question is to Ms. Uh, Sanita Shah, if I have your name correct. Um, in terms of the distribution of your products, are you working with hotels in Kenya? Because previously, uh, well, I have a background working uh, with ecotourism in Kenya, and there was a lot of demand for uh, these sustainable products within certified accommodations, but there was no distribution from Kenya that could be accessed. So uh, is this also a channel that you're looking at in terms of distributorship? And um, is it a possibility to expand it through that way? Thank you. Sasha, do you have any questions online? Uh, okay. Only praise, praise for the great good practices. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, 
I think we have uh, two questions uh, for Mumbo and a comment. Yeah, and then one question for Anita. Mumbo, do you want to go first? Okay, thank you. Before I answer the questions, I'll also ask uh, a question. <laughs> but to Macedonia, I, I have not been to Macedonia, but I would, I'm seeing more or less you have the similar situations that we have here in developing world. I don't know how the government is supporting you so that we can be able to learn from your practice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, coming to the question about the plastic ban, the pl I think uh, when you lived during that time of 200 and, uh, 2007, it was really a men. It was really a big menace. It was just really an ISO. So uh, this was. It was. It was not something that was just decided once. Uh, once um, immediately, uh, it was something that was conceived. Uh, during when NEMA came into place, we tried to come up with economic instruments, but every time we wanted to come up with the ins instruments, the industries were frustrating us, and it's like now it reached a point like we you know we didn't have a um, way to go through. So this is actually one of the method of dealing with plastics. And uh, I, I understand because it came almost like a bang. Yeah, but that was basically to deal with the category of plastics that was actually causing an ISO that was actually, you know, it was just to control this problem immediately. But also, but uh, we have also learned from that um, that situation because we banned using a cassette notice and uh, we were supposed to come up with a, a plastic regu a regulation that actually provides for alternatives, provides for means on how, and all these opportunities that you're also being mentioned here. What I can actually say, um, I really congratulate the two, uh, the Green Stem, even for the good work they have done. Like uh, those ones who are dealing with um, sugar cane, it's really a big problem within the, um, um, in the agri sector within the Western, but now I'm already seeing opportunities here. The challenge about recycling and these other options that you've mentioned we we didn't provide for standards we didn't provide for how when you do recycling how should the the the, the code, 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 code product look like we didn't provide for um but we gave alternatives but now these alternatives of course if it is not in law you know the gazette notice talked about burning but now when you give the alternatives these alternatives need to also us have um standards in itself so those are those are the things that you're working on like when uh, we are mentioning these standards about uh, researching plastic you know the challenge that comes here is about assuming plastic has heavy metal like the ones she's just mentioned we import a lot of this and then we recycle and then we bring it back to the market it's still the same children will be using the same ball pen and you know feeding them so we are working on laying the basis of foundation uh there's also about um the issue of alternatives yeah We've been approached by quite a number of industries and also investors on how to come uh, with alternatives. But what you're working on is to actually make sure that the standards that we provide for these alternatives are something that are actually workable. So that's actually, uh, but uh, you can see this strategy that we employed here has also been used in Tanzania. It's something that has also been used in uh, in Rwanda. It's not going to Ni Nigeria. And the challenge that you are facing here are similar like in Rwanda. Rwanda is actually facing other parties which are actually, you know, so it's something that it's unique to a developing country. That's an enforcement, but you also need to look at what he was mentioning here, my colleague, about sustainability issues. As we're talking about extended producer responsibility, and uh, you can actually see what came from um, uh, Green Stem. Uh, now we are developing what we have a sustainable management act we also have we also have a waste management strategy that goes to 2030 we also have uh, what we call um extended producers responsibility i cannot talk about all that here because i didn't come to make a presentation but you know these are just like some of the work that you may not be very clear but what needs to come out clearly the government just provides a framework upon which we can be able to do but what's coming out clearly from me is like now we also need to see what can also work to uh the communities, not just only for the big players within the market. I would beg to to stop just to allow. <laughs> uh, uh, my, uh, Chair, allow me. I just need to understand from uh, the ministry. Uh, all you're talking about is this accessible to us as uh, the citizens. Like whatever the strategy you have for us, is this accessible in your in your portal? Yeah. Is it where 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 can we be able to get this information? for us to scrutinize it, for us to know this is what we're going to suggest to you like in an open forum like this and how you can work with a, an organization like STEM because they're having a challenge 
for partnership with the government. How can we get this information? Okay, what I'll do, I'll uh, give the coordinators here the um, link. You can be able to download, but you can also discuss further even after the meeting how to get to, but all these documents are available within the NEMA, even Ministry of Environment website. Yeah, you go specifically to Waste Management uh, Portal. Priscilla, also, this is your guy here, uh, Griffins. Uh, if you have any, please reach out to him. Yeah, thank He'll you. We'll connect you to the ministry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Anita, please quickly, so that we can give uh, uh, James and uh, Rebecca time to. So just thank you all so much for your support. Um, and that adds strength on a difficult journey. So just to say that um, our products are very versatile. They can be used for fruit and vegetables, meat and fish, baked goods, uh, restaurants and cafes and lodges as, as well. Um, up until now, we didn't have enough production capacity. That was the challenge. But as we scale, as we produce 2.4 million pieces, the challenge will be to actually sell all of it. So really open to having a conversation with you later and uh, let's see if we can collaborate. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's only fair that uh, we have Rebecca here all the way from Nakuru and James also from Nakuru. Uh, they need to have their chance to share what they have been doing uh, because they have been working with waste pickers and also... Sorry? Oh, from Mas uh, to, to Macedonia. Do you want to respond in a very quick way? Yeah, if we have a time, I will, I will answer a very short way. I can say that our government uh, is supportive, uh, concretely on the menstrual pets. Uh, after a few years of fighting, um, uh, they decrease, they increase the tax from eight. Yeah, they decrease the tax from 18 to 5 percent. And now we are piloting uh, free of charge uh, menstrual pets uh, to some schools and the capital in the Skopje. The uh, municipality decide uh, to give uh, free of charge uh, menstrual pads to each girl that is in the regular curricula that this is the steps uh, the steps ahead uh, and uh, together with uh, some company that they produce the hygiene uh, they have decided uh, after our um, a big campaign to reduce the price uh, uh, especially to the menstrual uh, cups uh, and to organic uh, menstrual pads uh, as, an, as one alternative also to reduce the environmental pollution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we now give chance to uh, Rebecca. Rebecca uh, is the chair of the Waste Picker Association in Nakuru. Uh, she has been working uh, with waste pickers in Nakuru. And as we know, the data shows that most of the uh, waste pickers are women and children. Uh, but she's going to share some of the challenges or some of the things that they have been doing uh, in Nakuru. Please, Rebecca, there's a chance. I will speak in Swahili. Uh, what? I'm what? Okay, that's a surprise to me. <laughs> uh, then there'll be translation, no? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Nimekuwa nikifanya kazi kwa dump site ya Nakuru for the last 20 years. I've been, I've been working in a dump site for the last 20 years. <laughs> eh, challenge ya kwanza kwa landfill, three quarters ni wamama na watoto. Three quarter of the persons working in the dump sites are women and children. So, unakuta wakati plastic zinakuja most affected ni wamama kwa sababu sisi ndio tunapatikana pale na eh, serikali ilikuwa ina ilikuwa before ilikuwa inawatilia di hazardous waste zinafika huko what you notice is that when the waste come mostly it meets the women and children and in, in the previous uh, the hazardous waste that was coming uh, was be, was coming to the to dump site was okay the waste that was coming to the dump site was hazardous that's previously until they started campaigning. Na tunafanya kazi bila gloves, so unakuta tunapata magonjwa. One of the concern, of course, is uh, from the from the uh, from the ha hazardous waste. They also get uh, diseases and like, other, you know, like af asthma, uh, asthma, cancer, yeah. cancer, pneumonia, pneumonia, cuts, wounds. Yeah. So. Mm, 
Yeah, go ahead. The next challenge ni watoto wa waendi shule because mara mingi tuko na wale polish wa, wa, wa landfill. There's also the challenge of uh, child labor uh, because most of the uh, children are coming from a poor background and they are the source of the income for most of their families. Ikifika wakati wakuza ata plastic kuna kuta middleman wana wamefinya ile bay. Also, the business is not that good uh, because uh, they also operate in the in a, in a setup whereby they, they the business is controlled by middlemen. So the money that gets to the to, to these women and children is very little. So thank you. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, her sharing. Uh, we also we also get a chance to interact with her later, but I will give this chance to James. James is one uh, of my champion <laughs> uh, in, in Kenya. She has been uh, the lone voice uh, at some point. I say so uh, because uh, she he is always in the in the social media uh, talking about uh, you know the, uh, waste, uh, plastic, all manner of things, and uh, I follow him because I like what he posts. But I, uh, he works also with Rethink uh, Plastic Campaign. Please, would, would you like to share also what you, you, your company is all about uh, and where you work in? Thank you. Oh, thank you so, so much, Fred. Uh, as you have heard, my name is James Okibia, and I'm mostly known for campaigning against plastic waste. I think I started around 2012. Up to now, I'm still doing it. I played a big role in the ban on plastic bags in Kenya, and I'm happy that Dr. John Mumba is here. And a good question has been asked about why you banned plastic bags only to allow newer plastics to come into, into the market and to continue polluting the environment. Uh, my campaign on uh, uh, Lethink Plastics is theory to ask people to move away from uh, single-use plastics or unnecessary plastics. Sometimes we do not need uh, some kinds of plastic that you use. Like if you see our tables today, I see a lot of uh, plastic, plastic bottles that are can be used again and again. They are not single-use plastics. I see containers for refilling water, and I think that is what we need uh, to do. But uh, beside that, uh, with reading plastics, I am also involved a lot with uh, campaigning or calling, calling for more to be done in uh, coming up with uh, regulations to ban more plastics, ban more single-use plastics, introduce more regulations on managing plastic waste uh, because uh, I think all that time I've been uh, campaigning against plastic waste. I've seen it in our rivers. I think uh, most people have seen my pictures, you know, circulating around the world. Most of the, you know, I've documented uh, our rivers really polluted with a lot of plastics. Our drains uh, being blocked by plastics, our trees covered by plastic uh, bags. So really, uh, my call is for people to move away from uh, single-use plastics. And uh, in a world where, you know, where we are swamped or filled with plastics, it's almost impossible to think of alternatives. And Anita here is a good example that in, indeed alternatives are there. Just recently, Lagos State in Nigeria, a state with over 870 no, uh, 15 million uh, people, that's a, a population of 15 million people, banned the use of uh, styrofoam uh, food packs, the kind of uh, material uh, she is making with her company. That means, uh, indeed, there are alternatives, you know, to, to single-use plastics. If in a state, like Lagos State in Nigeria, that produces 870 thousand tons of waste annually, you know, and it has banned uh, styrofoam food packs. You, that means a lot of waste will be will be reduced because of uh, an, in, an inventor or somebody who is thinking about the environment. Therefore, we can do a lot to rethink about plastics and to do what I call to go less plastics, to use uh, feedable containers, to even in our at home nowadays, I think the government would introduce something called um, Mama Pima. I think it's a it's a way where customers can go to a shop 
instead of carrying, uh, instead of buying new cooking oil in a container, they just carry their their containers, their reusable containers. They can buy a liter or two liters of uh, cooking oil. You know, I think also there is uh, a lot we can do uh, in, uh, especially what I do in campaigning uh, as an individual responsibility. We can uh, petition governments. We can advocate for solutions through social media, through writing articles in the newspapers like CJD has been doing, and uh, a lot more. I think all that I have been doing since 2013. That's why Fred is saying that I, I do a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, that will be it for now. Thank you very much, James. Um, and we, now it's at five, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but if you allow, uh, if you have questions, I'm happy to stay here for another 10 minutes. What do you think? OK, uh, since you agree, uh, that gentleman at the end, uh, please, sorry for calling you that gentleman, but uh, the gentleman at the end, uh, you go first. Um, then, uh, yeah, the gentleman at the center, he, uh, the far end, and the lady next to me, you ask your question, right? Uh, did you have an answer? <laughs> okay, I thought it was addressed. So let's ask for, have those first three questions, then uh, we see where we are. Thank you. Uh, from how I pointed, from you. Yes. Um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Davis. I'm a waste collector and um, recycler. So first question I'll address to um, Miss the uh, Minister of Environment. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Mumo, um, as you've said, uh, I wouldn't mention any name, but there is a NEMA official, I'm sorry to say this, but who once told me that Dandora can be cleared in a day, uh, I think that would uh, be something that you can address on. One um, question, please, if you have two now, we can't allow because uh, we have to give uh, that gentleman his time. Oh, I thought ask a question. Yeah. Oh, I thought the question is how, whether the door no, can no, be no, moved that in a day. That was just but a comment. Okay. I've been carrying it for many years. <laughs> Go ahead. <then. laughs> uh, my question is, um, as you've said, uh, we've been talking about waste um, as a collector, yes, and someone who does recycling. Um, someone said recycling is just but a blanket, which is very true. Let's come up with something as Istanbul. 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 Uh, produces electricity from waste. 3,000 tons produces electricity for 1.4 million homes. That's 85 megawatts. Nairobi, as of now, takes 2,000 2, tons of waste every single day to Dandora. What do you think that would do? Don't you think it will produce enough electricity for all of us? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's your chance. Thank you. I'm Yusuf from Sudan. Um, my question is for um, Dorothy. Um, we didn't get your name, sorry. I'm Yusuf from Sudan. Yusuf. Um, my question for Dorothy, I'm from research center that I'm caring about research. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand that for how um, we're trying to link between awareness campaign, because the, um, I believe that all, the old version of awareness campaigns don't work. Uh, social media will know that all African countries, including Kenya, uh, rural area, so it's not on a social media. Did you um, provide an alternative for raising awareness? I mean, um, um, <clears throat> the guy from um, artist that um, he's saying that he raising awareness from environmental issues. So could you um, and it work with with someone who at the levels of uh, artists that um, to help you reach the people in the grassroots? Because we're all addressing that research. That thousands, hundreds of research are in in the rules, that no one reads them, they no apply them, even the governments, they're not taking care about research. So we need a shortcut to see it because the pollution is moving very fast and um, our action is very slow. Our action is very slow. So um, there's, um, there's a question for you. And I have just a second question for, um, it's an essential question that uh, for how that the, the government, they support them um, for, for, for the innovative, for Anita, that, for how the, the government they, they, they push them and to support them in 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 in, produ in 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 working with uh, with the recycling. I mean that there is a quite perfect alternative solution for the plastic. So did it receive the government support for for the process? 
Thank you very much. Um, it's your chance. Thank you very much. My name is Felicia Mariga from Kenya. My question goes to Ms. Anita. That's very a very good work you're doing. But on the matter of sustainability and profits, how af affordable are your products so that you can be able to reach to the common Kenyan in the ground who is not able to afford? Is it very affordable for us than plastic? Or kindly advise on that? Thank you. I think we still have another chance for two more questions. Uh, OK, how many are there so that we can see? OK, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Then we close, OK? And then we see. Uh, but I'll start with you at the end because your hand was up first. Is that OK? Yeah. No. Hello. Um... My name's Amrin and I'm quite interested in this space mainly because I run a biogas startup in which we produce biodigesters to be able to produce um, green energy, cooking gas and electricity. My question is specifically um, in regards to the Ministry of Environment and I'm curious to know as I as I grow in the space I'm I'm curious to know how does um, you know, the Environment Ministry uh, collaborate with other government departments or organizations to support the growth of biogas industry um, and address environmental challenges effectively, mainly because we know that biogas is directly, you know, in, you know, capturing harmful, you know, methane and carbon that fills our landfills. And I think one of the stats that I came across was that Nairobi alone produces 3,000 tons of waste. 60% of that is organic. So I'm curious to know how the Environment Ministry and NEMA are supporting um, initiatives that are in, you know, that that particular space. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's your chance. Yes, my, my name is Brian Kitenji. My question is to any of the panel. For the last three financial years, the government has exempted companies that recycle plastics from paying the 16% VAT. So my question is, why can't we have the same, same, in the same, same spirit, why can't we have an exemption of companies that make alternative products like Sisol, like polymer bags, like the ones that you are referring to from paying the taxes, the same, same way that they are doing for the plastics. And lastly, also, just to add, because it's important, uh, for, for you to run a plastic recycling business in Kenya, you need to get a certificate from NEMA, a clearance certificate. We know the procedure is, is usually a little bit skewed according to African standards. So my question is, is there any, any strategy for us to streamline the process so that young people who want to engage in this business can get the clearance and cannot get be cannot be disturbed or disenfranchised by enforcement authorities? Thank you. Everyone likes your questions. Uh, Brian, uh, it looks up your followers here, uh, but we'll go to you now. Uh, you had a question? I don't have a question, but I want to say something. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Rebecca to speak in her language because it's the only way to save our language and uh, our custom and learn the people who, who are I am. OK. Second thing I want to say uh, about alternatives that we have a lot of alternatives to produce bioplastic, but it's the only things we should uh, keep is what is the prices and how is it the, the way to scale up because we are we are the pollution is increasing every day, but how we can uh, create some things we can make this from bio plastic to bioplastic and scale up uh, and the the Last thing I want to say, I want to invite the government and all people here to collaborate together. And uh, I want to invite the government especially to involve every, everyone in the uh, country because it is not uh, single, single, uh, single things we can make. It is the teamwork. It is uh, we can create together a sustainable future for all generation. Uh, so uh, I I want to invite uh, uh, Minister of Environment to involve youth and children in the process to keep our environment in clean, and uh, I want to uh, say that uh, let's keep our environment clean and take steps now because we want to be part of solution, not pollution. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, that, okay. Those are comments. Uh, okay. We'll, we'll, please, can you? 
hold on, please. Hold on, because also I promised that I only had 10 minutes, and now it's already 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, please, if you allow but, but me. But I was please, among the you, people. If you allow me, please. Can you? I'll, I'll come to you, okay? Uh, because uh, also Zabron is, is complaining uh, or protesting that uh, his question on uh, the roadmap to achieving the 40% recycling uh, lead, w w how the roadmap would look like. And thank you very much, Dr. Mumbo, for accepting to come and also taking all the questions. It's not easy. Some of the questions will be addressed by, uh, or especially on energy, will be addressed by Griffins. Uh, but I will give you this chance. Uh, you address the questions that you got. And then from there, we'll have closing remarks from, the, the, from my panel. And then we'll end it there, please, if you, if you allow. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to start from this. Um, I want to put it from this other context. I, I don't know whether all of us we understand sustainable development. Uh, when you're talking about in the context of sustainable development, we have uh, the economy, we have the um, economy, environment, and the social social aspect. Yeah, and. Uh, you are all operating in the space of environment. And, you know, uh, why, why I'm bringing this aspect is like, we really need to work hard on creating um, awareness and to, you know, help to, to help each other to really appreciate the role that environment does. And that's actually what we are working so hard in, um, in pushing in, 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 uh, in, in, you know, in, in, um, you know, once the space of environment comes out clearly, once we have like we have this forum here, then United, just be patient, uh, United Nation Environmental, uh, you know, meeting that you're having assembly here. This basically to create awareness to the government that the environment is actually the resource base and therefore we need to put more efforts on it. So just to go to the questions like uh, one made a, a, a question here about Dandora can be create, can be cleared in one day. That is very true. But at the same time, you're also encouraging us to, you know, to prove to promote to utilize the same uh, waste for energy. You know, um, for us to go that way, you know, this this um, we we've realized waste management is actually a business model in itself. It's actually a source. Let me put it, a source of livelihood. Yeah, you when you want to deal when you want to manage waste. There are those ones who work like our, our colleague from um, Nakuru is a waste collector, you know. So, and and uh, there are quite a number of, she's mentioned about many uh, stakeholders who rely on uh, this kind of industry. I'm not trying to justify why we are not clearing Nandora in one day. Uh, what, what I'm saying is that there's need for stakeholder consultation and especially, you know, when you start touching on environment, the social will come up and start making noise, you see. Yeah, but what I'm trying to bring up is it's a complex matrix that when it comes to the developing uh, countries, one has to look at very many, uh, very many things that actually play into this space. So the need for stakeholder consultation. And I'm just addressing this question about what he meant about um, Dandora. Yes. What goes to Dandora is actually basically organic waste. This organic waste can actually even be used for different, uh, for, for, for manure, it can be used for electricity. But there are also stakeholders there, I'm told it's like almost how many, 40,000 or maybe I don't have exact facts who rely on the same. So, you know, there's a need for coming up with a really sustainable way on how to deal with this uh, challenge. So going now to the issue my colleague mentioned here about the issue of uh, government pro pro uh, supporting alternatives it is true but when it comes to to promoting alternatives one mentioned here about uh, we banned plastics but now the alternatives that came into place are the ones which are causing more problems so these pro alternatives if we have we have even had industries we banned plastics the next thing that the industry was really con uh, scared about was the banning of the plastic bottles we are heading that direction but they came and uh, you know they really implode on the government so you know like when you touch on um, environmental conservation you trigger trade you trigger ministry so what we are working so hard is like we have to work together together with these trade components and all the other actors within this space and that's why now it brings me to the issue of alternatives if the alternatives come into place like what uh, uh anita has proposed here 
is actually a perfect good example because it's sustainable in the sense that they, it's using um, uh, materials which are um, don't cause harm to the environment. Even the layering that's also being used is actually she, she talks is, is a bio best kind of alternative. But now. Um, uh, what's happening when it comes to the plastics? We also have big companies from, um, you, uh, from the, you know, within controlling the chemical space within a developing world. They want to bring alternatives to uh, to plastics, these biodegradable plastics. We have to look at the granules that they are bringing into market. This, you know, they they come and talk with pellets. They come and bring all those many samples. But do we have the capacity to detect to see the quality of these granules which are coming? Would you have the uh, ability to, you know, you want to? promote what is actually going to be very safe. And um, going to what we are talking about, uh, she, she also mentioned about the issue of uh, uh, carbon, uh, you know, the issues of using the biogas. We are developing instruments, like for example, last month, we had a tool, uh, we are getting into the space of what is, is called the uh, carbon markets. We are coming up with the carbon markets regulations. We also have um, regulations which are actually dealing with the plastics you know, and um, it's going to become law very soon so that like now you're able, if you want to do plastics or waste management at the county level, because waste management is a, is a, is a devolved function. The challenge is like, how do these stakeholders, uh, you know, benefit from this stream? And um, somebody mentioned here about the issue of zero rating of plastics. Yeah, that one was actually, they actually when it was, uh, it was zero rated because once we burned it was basically to spur the economy to come up with the alternatives. But when that went up, of course, we, you know, I don't want to, you know, we are, we are <laughs> I'm speaking for the government, I don't want to, to say why it didn't, but those those are actually what where we are actually uh, coming up with the economic instruments so that, you know, we don't have a situation whereby we have to keep on, keep on asking and uh, keep on uh, begging for incentives. So that's like, once it is in law and you know you're coming and you're addressing alternatives, you know, this is actually what applies so that the treasury does not have to you know work around and to do the maths to you know go around like that so that like now uh, the case that we have for macedonia you see this is an example just it just replicates what we have here in we had here in kenya uh and and going back to my colleague who mentioned there about uh recycling is not uh the bullet yeah it's just one of the options like i talked about a extended producer responsibility we are talking about controlling waste at the source cleaner production um, technology we are talking about uh, the aspect of uh enforcement they talked about alternatives they are talked about uh, there are quite a number uh, I, was, I was just mentioning uh, down here and uh, uh, there's also uh, but all these you know this we need to provide a good or uh, standards that regulate this industry so that you don't have a situation whereby uh, an alternative comes into place, but it also now becomes another problem. So, but the bottom line here is that as stakeholders here, when we go back, we just need to keep on pushing at your own level that let us prioritize environmental management when it comes to development plans. Let us have enough resources going into that money so that what this proposal that you're having here, that even the ministry or the environmental sector can be able to fund these activities that you are having here. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arit. Um, and now we'll have uh, very quickly uh, a word from each panel, pan, panel panelist. Uh, and also, if you have any policy recommendation to take home with, uh, please give us uh, very quickly one sentence, then we, we close the meeting. Griffins. Thank you so much. Uh, mine will just be very brief, just to respond. I, ju I just want to I wish that we don't leave the room uh, with this notion of what we call false solution. So one of the suggestions was talked about waste to energy. So as an organization, we don't advocate for that. And I think Mumbo uh, mentioned about that. We don't want to solve a problem by creating more problems because of the issues of air pollution, issues of dioxin, we talked about chemicals, because there's nowhere that it has been proven that it is environmentally sound. There's what we call environmentally sound waste management. So when you talk about that, you will need more waste to spar that energy plant that you're talking about. So you'll be creating more waste, so to speak. So this has not been proven, proven to be environmentally sound. And you need more energy to convert that wet waste into that energy that you're talking about. So we can have a conversation around that. Um, uh, and there are more experts that can also share more about that. Thank you. Thank you. Sasha, do you have any final words? Policy recommendation of any? Thank you very much. Um, I really, really enjoyed this dialogue. I, th I thank also very much the ministry for your 
staying with us and taking all these questions and engaging with us with our difficult questions. And it is really not an easy solution. I also want to thank Rebecca for coming. Thank you very much. I believe the social aspects of this issue are so important and the gender dimensions you showed about that in a way you are doing us all a favor. We buy cheap plastic products, we throw it away. You are the one who are dealing and cleaning and solving the problems for us. We're not paying for that as consumers, but you are paying with your health uh, and that of your families. And therefore, I would like to suggest that we do more to support waste pickers um, to be working with local governments. Uh, there are really great examples where women waste pickers associations work with the local authorities to do composting of all the organic waste or to work on biogas and to earn money and to have a green transition so that you still have good jobs, but healthier jobs, which also help uh, our environment. So thank you so much for coming. Dorothy, any final words? My final words also come as a response to a question that was forwarded to me, and that was, are we using other methods of sensitizing? Yes, there, there is one of the ways because who actually uses art music to spread this awareness, and I also believe that there's opportunity there. But just to finalize is to ask all of us to look inward ourselves. What are we doing, first of all? Are we always pointing to somebody else to create the awareness, to do what to, but ourselves as individuals, are we separating our ways at the household level? So to take initiative ourselves and to do more than um, more that we have been doing. So thank you. James. Oh, thank you very much. Mine first is to congratulate Nema for still uh, receiving a lot of uh, feedback from us but still working hard uh, to ensure that these uh, regulations are put in place. We have a ban on plastic bags, still not too bad. It's working over, I think they said over 80%. And then we have a new law, sustainable waste management. Now we can sue individual companies and take them to court if we find their brands in the river. And also something very important, I visit uh, waste pickers in uh, Gerto dumping site in Nakuru. And I found they have a, a place that they were given or they got for themselves. They have fenced it and they need a lot of support. They need equipment. They need compacting machines to be able to, you know, to make more money. They need personal protective equipment so that they don't dig into the dumping to the, to the dirt with their bare hands. They need everything. So bring, give them all the money so that they do much more. Their environment's number, environmentalist number one. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. I'll also just uh, conclude by responding to a question, which was about affordability. So we have a different range of products. Obviously, for export, the standard is different. Uh, but for local market, for example, um, this palm leaf can be turned into this kind of spoon or this kind of bowl. And uh, it doesn't require a lot of processing and export uh, compliance. Um, and just to say again, thank you all for your support. And um, I really appeal to NEMA to support us in our current appeal to Treasury and Ministry of Industry to waive uh, taxes on the machinery import. Thank you. Thank you. That's a strong message. Uh, I hope uh, the ministry will also take that to the Treasury. Uh, Rebecca, please. Mine is to thank you. And na concern, you nilikuwa venye wakibi amesema, wa mama ndo tuko wengi kwa dam site. Just like uh, what James said, uh, women, uh, we are the majority in the dam site. So, tunaitaji tuna sana pesa ma sponsorship, ndo at least kama nakuru tuko na maali tume and the recycling to now put our waste zote to let a mali moja. So financing, financing need to be put in place uh, for waste pickers, uh, you know, welfare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Natasha, uh, your final word. Uh, thank you. I will say that um, plastic pollution is a shared responsibility. Starting of that, I think that the education and awareness, it can be one of the solutions uh, for a cleaner, uh, uh, planet uh, and uh, uh, to find the solutions for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our applause to every particip uh, participant also the panelists. <clears throat> Thank you. I usually pride myself for being a good timekeeper, but today I, <laughs> I was not able to do that. And thank you for giving me extra 20 minutes or 22 minutes. Uh, and thank you very much for being attentive.
I thank you all. Until we meet next time, remember on Thursday we have been called for another side event. Monday. Monday, yes. 6.30. Conference room one. Uh, will this two? Yes, uh, please make sure that you attend and we, we, may, we continue this discussion. Thank you very much. Yes. Sorry, sorry, everyone, if I could have your Many attention. Many thanks to our dear sorry. Frederick from Henry Bill Stift in Kenya for hosting us so well. Um, sorry, if, you, if I can have your attention before we leave, my name is Georgina. I work for Sajad. And uh, this is to the Kenyans in the room. We work to strengthen civil society alliance and coalition to engage with government. And so we have an alliance and coalition that we are working with currently. And um, I noticed there's a lot of very eager civil society in the room. Um, and instead of putting the government in the hot, on the hot seat, we can now work together with the government to achieve all these things we are hoping to. So if you can please come to me and give me your contact so that we can add you to this collision and continue working together, that would be amazing. Thank you all.